Trust you have your Bibles this morning. Judges chapter 6. Judges 6. He would start out as a weak leader. But he would be led by a strong God. His name... Gideon. Gideon. Judges 6. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, it says in verse 1. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midianites for seven years. If you remember, if you've read the Old Testament, if you've read a little bit about the Old Testament, if you kind of just followed along with us the last few months, the Israelites were told way back a generation or so before to do away with the Midianites, okay, to kill them, to do away with them. For the reason is, is because the Lord God knew that if they did not do this, the Midianites would what? They would bring in their ways of living, their false worship, into the ways of the Israelites, and the Israelites would be corrupted, and they would turn from the Lord God. And that is exactly what happened. The Israelites did not do what they were told. The Midianites would again regain themselves, if you will, produce. A generation or so later down the road, the Israelites would find themselves doing evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord God would hand them over to the Midianites for seven years. This would be given as a sort of a discipline in a way that the Lord's able to draw the Israelites back to Himself. The Midianites, it says, would be cruel to them. Be cruel to the Israelites. The Israelites would have trouble dealing with them and they would be sort of enslaved to the Israelites. And this is what happens. This is what happens when a believer, when you or me today, believers of, believers of the Old Testament, refuse to follow the instructions of Scripture, refuse to follow the instructions of the Word of God, what happens? Eventually, you're, you're, you're given over to the consequences of your refusal. Eventually, you're, you're turned over to the, to the choices that you've made and you deal with those consequences because of your disobedience. We're no different than the Israelites. We've said in the past, if you remember, the Israelites went in and out of following the Lord God. They would follow the Lord for a time and then they would not follow the Lord God for a time. The Lord would intercede and be merciful to them. And they would follow the Lord God again. And then they would not follow the Lord God again. And that's how it went on. On and on and on with the Israelites. That's exactly how they would, they would pretty much live their lives. That very way. And this is what's going on here in Judges chapter 6. They're doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Eventually, they would call out to the Lord God for redemption, for help, and the Lord God would provide it. And He would provide them help, mercy, through a man by the name of Gideon. Gideon wasn't that strong, guys. I don't know if you know the history about Gideon, but he was a weak leader, very, very weak. But he served a strong God. 
You see, that's the kicker right there. It's the same thing for you, and it's the same thing for me. None of us sit here very strong. Actually, we're all pretty pitiful. Spiritually speaking, we're all pretty pitiful. and It's only when we work through the Spirit of the Lord God, through the power of Christ, that we're able to do what we do. Paul references this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 8. He says this, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. To take away that which buffeted him. But each time the Lord God said, my grace is all you need, my power works better in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Oh, saying, I, I learned that through my hardships, that through my weaknesses, it was Christ that would be demonstrated. It was the power of Christ that would be set on high. It, it was the power of Christ that people would see. Paul oh, said it wouldn't be me. But oh, a lot of times if we're not careful, we miss that point in Scripture. A lot of times people will give accolades to Paul or other people of Scripture. And they will so lift them up to a level where they do not belong, to a place where they do not belong. Because they're only able to do what they've done through the power of Christ that allowed them and given them that ability to do that. Paul says in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in my insults, my persecutions, my hardships. The troubles that I suffer, I suffer for Christ. When I'm weak, then I am strong. I'm, then I am strong in Christ, he says. Paul says all that I went through, all that my weaknesses, all of the weaknesses that I showed were demonstrations of the power of Christ. It was to show Christ, to lift Him, to lift Him on high. The same thing in Judges chapter 6, the same thing throughout history, the same thing in the future for Christianity. When we are weak, it shows His power, it just shows His strength the strength of Christ. Israel has done serious evil in the sight of the Lord. Every time they planted crops, the Midianites would show up and they would destroy the crops. They would attack Israel. They would make life very difficult for Israel. Why? Because sort of this is Israel's consequence. A generation or so before, they should have done away with the Midianites, but they didn't, and now they're suffering the consequences of their disobedience. Sound familiar? I guarantee it sounds familiar, because there's plenty of choices you should have made in your past in following the Lord God, the instructions of Christ, and you went a different way, and now you get to suffer the consequences of it. Some of us, the consequences suffer a life, a, a, a life of a, a lifetime, if you will. Others, it's not so long, but it's the consequences that we suffer for disobedience. It's the same thing with the Israelites back in Judges chapter 6. They suffered the consequences. They were left with nothing to eat. As the Midianites would come in and they would take all their sheep, take all their goats, their cattle, their livestock. They would strip them bare. So eventually the Israelites would be reduced to starvation. Why? Because of their disobedience. But there would be a time that would come, it says in verse 6, Judges 6, that Israel would finally cry out to the Lord for help. And the Lord God would intercede. Even in Paul's life, even in the disciples' life of the New Testament, the apostles' life of the New Testament, they too would cry out for help. 
and Christ would intercede and strengthen them as Paul just said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that when he is weak Christ is strong it's no different for you it's no different for me you're only able to serve to serve our Lord our Messiah our Christ our Jesus through his power through his strength it's only through him and it's only through the Lord God that the Israelites would find relief from the Midianites for their disobedience. They cry out to the Lord. And the Lord would send a prophet to the Israelites, it says in verse 7, in verse 8. And this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of, the, out of slavery of Egypt in verse 8 of Judges 6. I rescued you. I drove out your enemies. I gave you their land. I told you, I'm the Lord your God. You must not worship the God of the Amorites. In whose land you now live, it says in verse 10. I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, or do not worship them. In whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. In other words, you didn't listen to me. You refused to listen to me, Israel. So that's why you are in the situation you are in today because of your refusal to listen. God's plan is never for His children to walk outside of His will. Never. God's plan is never for you to walk outside of His will. Never has been, never will be. But the Lord in His grace and His mercy the angel of the Lord, it says, came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, which belonged to Joaz, the clan of Abiezar. Gideon, son of Joaz, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The Lord God would raise up, and he would provide a man by the name of Gideon to rescue Israel. Now Gideon would go from the threshing floor in hiding, okay, to war in the open. He would go from one, if you know the history of Gideon, you can probably relate a little bit. Gideon would go from, eh, I'm not so sure about this, to a mighty warrior for the Lord God. Even so, that he would be that he would find himself in Hebrews chapter eleven, verse thirty-two, the great what? The great Hall of Faith chapter. Remember, a few weeks ago we looked at Barak. He was in Hebrews chapter eleven, verse thirty-two. When the writer of Hebrews said time would fail me to not to mention of certain believers that had stood the test of time that served the Lord God mightily, Gideon would be there. He would be in that great hall of faith, if you will. He would start out weak. He would start out doubting. But he would in time find himself a great mighty man for the Lord God himself. Amen. The KJV says he would find himself out to be a mighty man of valor or a valiant warrior. But it wouldn't start out that way. Verse 13, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? So as the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you, 
Gideon's reply is this, well, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Sound familiar? Huh? How many times have you ever questioned what's going on in your life? How many times have you ever doubted the Lord? You sit there and say, oh, very rarely you're a liar because you've doubted the Lord. You're just like all of us. You doubt. The angel Lord appears to him and says, Mighty hero or O oh, valiant one, the Lord is with you. Giddens reply is this in verse 13 of Judges chapter 6. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? You see, there you go. You're a generation or so down the line. Why has all this happened to us? Where's all the miracles our forefathers, our fathers have told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us out of, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? Serious doubt. Serious doubt from Gideon. Didn't the Lord bring us out of Egypt? Ain't that what our forefathers said? Isn't that what our fathers said? But now it seems like the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have, Gideon. In other words, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. What strength? What strength does Gideon have? Is it strength that, that Gideon has in and of himself? Is it his own strength? No. Absolutely not. It's whose strength? Whose strength would Gideon go with to rescue Israel from the Midianites? Whose strength would it be? It would be with the strength of the Lord God. Listen to what it says in Psalm 73, verse 26. My flesh and my heart fails, but God is my strength of all my heart and my portion forever. Your flesh will fail you. Your flesh will fail you. I can assure you of that. Your heart will fail you. I assure you of that. There's going to come a time in your life, no doubt, when you will be put to the test. Your physical strength will not be able to make it, if you will. It's going to take what? It's going to take a supernatural strength. It's going to take a supernatural faith to get you through the circumstance, whatever it is. That's what it's going to take. And that's what it's going to take for Gideon. Because as you see right here, Gideon is in serious doubt. He would rather stay on the threshing floor. He would rather stay for the preparing of the wheat. He would rather stay preparing the wheat, hiding it from the Midianites. He would rather stay there. Because that's where his security is. Why? Because he's out of the battle, right? There's no struggle there. He can stay low. Out of sight, out of mind. His biggest concern is to keep the food, to keep to keep the food that the Israelites need away from the Midianites. If he can just stay out of sight, out of mind, he's fine. He's good with that. He's okay. I mean, Lord, let let somebody else do it. Why me? You ever been there? Why me, Lord? That's what he's saying. The Lord is with us. Why has all this happened to us? <clears throat> Brought us out of Egypt to be in this situation. Why has all this happened to us? As David just said, out of sight, out of mind. I like it better here. Go get somebody else to do it. That's how it is in ministry a lot of times. Most people remain out of sight and out of mind. Especially in the bigger churches. 
If I could just come in and sit in the back. Let somebody else. Let somebody else do it. I'll throw a little money in the offering plate and sneak out the back door and I'm good. I'm out of sight. I'm out of mind. Let somebody else pick it up. But the Lord turns to him and says, No, you go, Gideon. Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. Now understand, the Midianites are ruthless people. Very ruthless. They were a ruthless bunch. He says, you go. You battle the Midianites. Imagine being, put yourself in Gideon's position right now. The Lord God has come to you. You're on the threshing floor. You're doing what you want to do. You're out of sight, out of mind. As David just said, you're okay with it. The Lord God comes to you. The angel of the Lord comes to you and says, you're the one. You're going to be the one to go fight the Midianites. You're going to be the one to lead the way. It's going to be you. You're the chosen one. What would you do? I mean, most people, what? Take the easy way out, don't they? I mean, hey, come on. Get somebody else for this. Most people take the easy way out. Amen. But the Lord says, no, go with the strength you have. Rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. You're the one. It's going to be you. You're the one I've called. You're the one I've prepared. You're the one I'm going to send. It's going to be you, Gideon. It's going to be you. Gideon, it's, it, it's going to be nobody else. It's, it's going to be you. This is not up for debate. Amen. This is not up for discussion. It's going to be you. You're the one. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24, it says this, man's, going, man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? In other words, what? It's the Lord God who divinely leads. Amen. A lot of times you don't understand. Gideon, you're going to lead Israel. You're not going to understand what's going on. But you're going to lead Israel and you're going to have to completely lean on me for victory. Amen. And ultimately, you're going to do this battle with the Midianites. You're not going to do it with thousands of men, but you're going to do it with a few hundred. And you're going to go up against Thousands of Midianites. Why? Why will this happen? Why is the Lord God going to put Gideon in this position? So that the Lord God can demonstrate what? The power of Gideon? No. So that he can demonstrate his own power to Gideon and to the Israelites. For them to see that it's the Lord, it's the Lord God alone who has all the power. Amen. You read this passage of Scripture this morning. It's given to us, for us to see, that it's not about Gideon. Oh, that he's used, yes, but it's not about him. It's about the Lord God placing Gideon in a humanly impossible situation. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. He's doomed. But the Lord God places him so that his strength, the strength of the Lord God may be shown. Amen. That's what it is. Amen. That's what it is. Gideon's reply in verse 15 is understandable in Judges 6. How can I rescue Israel? How in the world 
am I going to rescue Israel? You understand that, right? I mean, this is a guy who's just sweeping the floors, pressing the wheat, preparing the food. On the threshing, threshing floor, if you will. Amen. His response, now he's being talked about being chosen as judge of Israel. His, his response is this, how, how can I rescue Israel? I mean, look at me. I'm just mere me. I'm just mere Gideon. Nothing special Amen. to look upon. We've said it before. In the past, if you read on the life of the Apostle Paul, he was just mere Paul. I mean, the guy wasn't intimidating at all. Remember? Remember what we looked at that in the past? Paul wasn't intimidating. He was actually little. Health problems. Small of stature. Did not speak well. Remember, we get all this out of Corinthians. He didn't speak well. He wasn't a great orator. He wasn't nothing intimidating to look at. I mean, he wasn't no Samson. There wasn't nothing about him. But why? Wow, did the Lord God not choose him and use him in such a way? And it's the same thing in, in our day and time. <laughs> As an example, as one example comes to my mind, just, I mean, you, you, I don't know if you, most of you probably have heard, if not all, have heard of Corey Ten Boom. Right? There's a prime example. A lady who went through the, the Nazi Holocaust, the Jews, with such great faith, such great faith in the Lord God to serve the Lord all the way through that, and serve after that all those years. She was, of course, nothing amazing to look upon. But that's what happens. The Lord God uses the weak things of this world to demonstrate just how great He is. Amen. Just how great He is. I think what happens to a lot of preachers especially is, is that they think too much of themselves and they don't realize that they are absolutely nothing without Him. Amen. And just as easily as He's placed them behind the pulpit is just as easily as He can take them away. And never put them back there again. Amen. Because sometimes they see too much of themselves and they don't see that it's about Christ. Or they want to be like the next great minister, the next great preacher. It's not about that. Amen. It's about Christ being elevated. And the Lord God to Gideon is this. Gideon, it's not about this. It's not about you. It's about me using you to bring my people back to myself. But then we'll find out it doesn't take long after Gideon passes that they fall right back into sin again. But it's about me being glorified, Gideon. It's about me. Amen. Gideon's response was very humanly in verse 15. How in the world can I rescue Israel? My gracious. My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. I'm the least in my entire family. I mean, you look around the family. I'm so weak. I'm so feeble. I'm just a little guy. Sound familiar? Who else was a little guy? Who else was a little guy in the Old Testament? King David, right? Huh? Amen. When they brought all the family members down, all the young men down, and the Lord said, this is not them. Where's they? We've got somebody else. And they said, well, he's out in the field. Old Nobby need David. Tending the sheep. He would be the one. Amen. Right? He'd be the one. He would be the one that the Lord God uses. Why? To demonstrate His power. Amen. Gideon says, I'm the, I'm the weakest, I'm the least in my whole entire family. I mean, I'm, I'm the runt. Okay? I'm the runt of the litter. Amen. I'm the runt of the litter. 
I'm the one who can never get it together. And Gideon's reply, okay, if you're truly going to help me, <laughs> show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. So Gideon has serious, serious, serious doubt, doesn't he? We all have been there. Amen. Jeremiah was told, I'll be with you, and Jeremiah doubted at times. David is told, I'll be with you, and David doubted at times. Paul, Paul said, I'll be with you. Paul doubted at times. Peter was told, I'll be with you, and Peter doubted at times. Gideon's no different. But through it all, eventually he would find himself in the, in, in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Why? Because he was a faithful man of God. Amen. He's got some doubt here in verse 17. If you're truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it's really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon would hurry home, cook a young goat with a basket of flour. He baked some bread without yeast. He carried the meat in a basket and brought in broth in a pot. He brought them out and presented it to the Lord who was under the great tree of Ophrah. The angel of the Lord God said, Place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of the staff of his hand and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought and the angel disappeared. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. I'm doomed. When he realized he was in the presence of a holy God, of the angel of a holy God, he said, I'm doomed. I'm doomed. See, the only way you can stand in the presence of the Father is through the Son. That's it. You will never stand in the presence of the Father unless it's through the Son. Never. That's what's so horrific about one that passes on from this life to the next without the Son, without faith in the Son, without faith in, faith in Christ, is that He will stand in the presence of the Holy Father without the Son. He will stand alone. With no intercessor. With no one to speak on his or her behalf. Listen. Gideon's response to realizing he's in the presence of a holy God says, I'm doomed. I'm doomed. Fear immediately strikes. Amen. It shudders you sometimes when you hear people mock the Creator God. Amen. It's bad enough when they deny Him. But to mock Him, to make fun of Him, is shuddering. To realize that they literally hang over hell. And he's the one holding them. But yet they mock. They mock this holy God. They mock this righteous God. Gideon, when he realizes it was the angel of the Lord, he cries out, O oh, sovereign Lord, it says in verse 22. O oh, sovereign God. 
He realizes it's the Holy One of Israel. An angel of the Holy One of Israel. He cries out. He perceived that it was an angel of the Lord. Gideon says, Alas, O Lord God, for because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face, fear strikes him. But it's needless. It's needless fear. Why? Because he's the chosen one. He's the one for the task. He's the one that the Lord has set his hand upon. And the Lord responds to his fear in verse 23. And the Lord says unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. It's all right, the Lord says. Do not be afraid. You will not die. Amen. You know, you can look at our own lives today. As we look in this life of Gideon, you can look at our own lives. We have, we have no reason to fear as believers, do we? Because what? Because we sit in the presence of a holy God who has set us apart for His glory and for His honor. For the ones that should fear or the ones that do not belong to Him. If you're here this morning, listen. And you know nothing of His saving faith. You should fear. Amen. You should live in fear. Because you're on your own. You have not an intercessor. You have not a redeemer. Because Christ does not belong to you. It's only when you call out to Him and repent and cry out to Him that your fears are taken away. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto you, fear not, thou shalt not die. He's speaking of a physical death here. Gideon's immediate response in verse 24 was, Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it, Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abyssalites. So Gideon's response was he immediately builds an altar there and he, and he names it what he names it, which means the Lord is peace. And to this day it says the Lord, the altar remains. And that night in verse 25, that night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. I want you to pull down your father's altars to, the, to, to Baal. I want you to cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. That's what I want you to do. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar using as fuel the, the wood of the astral pole you cut down. Oh my goodness gracious. What did the Lord just get done telling Gideon? This is what I want you to do, Gideon. He says, do this. The altar that was built to Baal, the false god, tear it down, Gideon. The Asher pole, the wooden pole that stands beside that, tear it down also. And after you tear the pole down, here's what I want you to do. I want you to cut the wooden pole up and I want you to use it as fuel for the fire. I want you to use it as fuel for the fire. You see, the Lord God does not look lightly on you or me or anybody worshiping someone else or something else other than himself. He doesn't turn a blind eye to that. The Israelites... Generation before or so, 
failed to do away with the Midianites. The Midianites have now drugged them into idol worship, Baal worship, worshiping all kinds of crazy stuff. The Lord God, they, and, and the Lord God allows it to go on for a time. The Israelites suffer greatly. They finally call out to the Lord. The Lord God listens to them. When they didn't listen to him at first, which got him in this mess, the Lord God provides somebody to see them through this, out of this, Gideon, but it'll be done in the Lord God's power. And the Lord God says to doubt in Gideon, here's what I want you to do. First off, I want you to, to destroy their false idol worship that they got set up. Destroy it. And not only that, take the pole that stood high, tear it down, cut it up, and use it for fire, for the offering unto me. And let me tell you something. This was serious. Because when Gideon did this, as we'll see, when Gideon did this, this would immediately what? Immediately the people of Israel would erupt in what? In uproar. Amen. Because he just tore down what they worshipped. What they looked at. And these people, yep, yeah, tore down their God and they don't like it. They want an answer. And they'll get one. They'll get one. See, the Lord God will use whomever He chooses Amen. to fulfill His purpose. Amen. And here in this story, in Judges chapter 6, He uses a, in, an obsolete, a no-name, the weakest of the weak of the family, man by the name of Gideon. He uses Gideon. A mere nobody. In the world's eyes at this time. Amen. But somebody that would go down in history. As one of the most faithful. And be placed into Hebrews chapter 11 again. The reason why I'm saying that a few times is because this. You see what man and women are capable of doing. When you read Hebrews chapter 11. When they do it through the power. Of the Lord God. Amen. They are capable of great things. Amen. Gideon would do just that. Albeit he would do it reluctantly at first. But he would do it. And he would realize. That it would be done. Through the power of the Lord God, the power that He would be clothed with. And you pick that up in verse 34 that ties right along with their verse 14 of Judges 6. Verse 34 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. He'd be clothed with power. As we close this morning, listen. When you look at the life of Gideon, understand that he was a mere man clothed with the power of a holy God. Amen. This wasn't Gideon. It was a holy God working through Gideon. Demonstrating his power through Gideon. Amen. To where this God would be lifted up. Our God, our Lord, our Savior. And when Gideon realized that it truly was the Lord, his response was, O oh, sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. May we have that same response in knowing that we serve a sovereign Lord, a sovereign God. Amen. And though we're not doomed as believers, 
So many around us are. That choose not to call on Him for salvation. May we pray for them. May we tell them about this sovereign Lord who one day will judge them. And it will be a righteous judgment. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord God. To you goes the glory and the honor and the praise. And we love you. As we look in Gideon's life this morning, Lord God, we can learn so much from it. A man who was in serious doubt. A man who was given a task of seems like insurmountable odds, humanly speaking. It, dis it doesn't make sense. Humanly, it doesn't. And just when Gideon thought this is crazy, in his mind it seems to get crazier when the Lord takes the thousands of his men that he has to fight the Midianites and reduces it to mere hundreds. And says, now go Gideon. But I'll go before you. We too must remember, Lord, that you go before us. In service for you, for your glory and your honor. We love you. We thank you. Use us for your glory. Remind us it's not about you. It's, a, it's not about us. It's about you. Remind us every time we serve you, it's about you. It's about your power. It's about your strength. As Paul said, when, I'm, when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, when I'm at my weakest, you're at, it's your strength that's, that's being demonstrated through me. You use the weak and feeble things of this world to demonstrate your strength. We love you and we thank you. Bring us back here this evening again to where we can look at a, a man by the name of Gideon who was the weakest of the family, the one who just tended to the food, just wanted to stay out of the limelight, wanted to stay out of the, out of sight, out of mind, mindset, just wanted to keep that. But the Lord said, no, I'm using you. We love you and we thank you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.